uh, Muhammad al-Hamadi, I wanted to talk to you, if I may here, about the base load that nuclear does provide, the clean energy, because we talked about the 5,000 biggest companies representing 30% of carbon emissions. Why don't you apply it to the UAE here, what nuclear does in terms of decarbonization, even the partnership you have with ADNOC uh, offshore, uh, to be able to clean up the cycle and the, that, what it unleashes in terms of other investments into other renewable technologies, for example. Thanks. Th thank you, John, for the, for the question. If I may just give you a quick uh, synopsis on what's, what's happening in the last 10 years in, in the UAE. So a decade ago, we launched multiple fronts to decarbonize our electricity sector with a priority also, and the priority was energy security. And uh, fast forward to today, we have uh, three reactors operational, reducing electricity. Uh, last year, 2022, we had 20 terawatts hour of electricity have been generated from those uh, two reactors. Today we have three, and next year we'll have four reactors. And those will generate 40 terawatts of electricity annually, and that's a lot of electricity. That will be equivalent to around 25% of electricity for the UAE, and that's a major transformation. Add to that also renewable energy. And that creates a model that other countries, I think, easily, or not as easy, to replicate. We've created a portfolio of energies that is clean, at the same time also provides energy security. And the third, which is very important, is that we can navigate and change between those energy sources. We have the gas, we have the nuclear, we have the renewable. And this is something we didn't have over a decade ago. So within 10 years, we managed to open those opportunities for us to be able to secure our energy, decarbonize it, and be able to maneuver between the different opportunities. And as Excellency Sultan Jabbar mentioned earlier, uh, and the theme of this conference about the uh, future proofing, we've done that in, in a decade. Now, to your question of what do we have in front of us going forward for the future, now we have multiple sources of energies we can navigate between, and we will definitely go with the, that provides the cleanest for the growth of the country and the development and prosperity of the nation. And we have the expertise of people, knowledge, and institutional knowledge. We can make nuclear projects bankable, done in a record time, done in a, within budget, which is, I think, we've managed to succeed in that in, in the last 10 years. Good. One quick question. I, I don't need a long intervention back, but I want to bring Francesca in. Uh, she brought it up from the private sector capabilities, and I think uh, Akvi could address this as well. But what does it unleash in terms of intellectual prowess, the education system, the STEM education, even unlocking women uh, that are working in energy today? A lot of people take it for granted, and you had me down at Baraka three times at different stages of the development when I was with CNN. Uh, what is it, with not the hocus pocus of it all, but what does it give you now as a base load of intellectual knowledge to accelerate a transition? That, that's a great question. And uh, yesterday I was, uh, I was hosting the energy and the secretary from the US at Baraka, and she's a, a nuclear professor. And she met with a lot of the engineers at, uh, at Baraka. And uh, there was a lot of also very highly talented, high, very highly talented uh, women engineers at Baraka. And she was telling, they was asking me, how do you guys do this? And uh, we've done this a, through a very systematic approach. We looked at the knowledge and expertise gap we had 10 years ago, actually more than 13 years ago. And we put a pipeline of, of capabilities and knowledge that we need to build over the, over the years. And fast forward to today, we have hundreds of nuclear engineers. We have hundreds of, of mechanical engineers who can do nuclear wow. uh, power plant work. And they're very highly talented. So imagine going from one or two nuclear experts in the country to having now hundreds. That unleashes a lot of 
opportunities of business opportunities. And if I may kind of a quick forward to what we could do with that knowledge and expertise, we could work on more nuclear power plants to be built. We could talk those ca capable, talented young people to work on the, through nuclear making molecules, hydrogen, making steam for the oil and gas and chemical process. So it opens a lot of door for us in, in, in these industries. And Her Excellency there, you know, we would definitely also have nuclear engineers of those young people also to power the future space program, the energy needed for the space in the future. So we didn't have that, now we have it today and we have this opportunity. So nuclear energy or nuclear industry it brings, it brings electrons, it brings steam, it brings hydrogen, but also brings a lot of opportunities we didn't have before. Great, thank you for taking it, uh, that question on. I was thinking about it when I heard that first panel uh, and we had the conversation at the World Utilities Congress where we didn't get a chance to cover that and to have the transition you need, the brain power at the same time. He's referring to Sarah Mary, uh, who works in advanced technology, public education, and the chairman of the space program as well. So it applies to all three of those jobs that she's doing today. Francesca, I didn't want to jump out of order, but you said to me before I came on the stage, um, it's nice to talk about the new technologies, and we are definitely going to cover that. Uh, but you also said something quite profound. You said, even in a very large energy company like any, you got to be able to have the organization ready to leverage. What do you mean by that? I mean that uh, everybody knows that the technology is the, at the heart of our transformation, of our transition. But then organization has to be fit for doing that. And uh, this, is, this is a point. This is a point that has not yet been discussed, I think it's worth introducing it. ENI is a big, large corporation. We, we come from our history in oil and gas, but then now we are really changing and we are really um, changing with our distinctive model where, of course, technology is at the heart. We have well clear in mind three pillars that we want to achieve. For sure, we wanted to achieve diversification and transformation of the energy mix. We have very clear that gas and methane is the bridge, the, the, the bridge for, for, the, for the transition, for the decarbonization. So we are also putting in place all what is needed for, uh, for tackling methane emissions. Then uh, we have also in mind that uh, ma uh, time to market is very important to put in place uh, new projects with new te technologies. So this is another pillar on which we are working very, very, very hardly, very strongly. Then there is uh, the different business models. So we have to be ready mm. to face new business models, to understand the opportunities of new business models. And we have to be ready to catch opportunities and to quickly and in an agile way make opportunities grow. So this has led us to change our big corporate organization in a satellite-like model where uh, our spin there are spin-offs from ENI, for example, Plenitude, yeah. the one which wo who works on renewables and, uh, and uh, retails, for example, very agile, agile uh, uh, big corporate spin-off that can very quickly tackle the opportunity that is offered from the application of the new technology that can very quickly understand the, the new model, the new business model, and they, then they can very quickly make partnership, make alliances, also with the subject which are not the normal and the classical subject that we that we are used to big, big technologies providers. So we are very open also to start up, for example. That's so interesting. This is, this is That's a, a different way of view. thinking yeah, for uh, This is e another I. point of view. Uh, Akhmed Kuwaiter, you know I've had a, 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 the privilege of going to uh, Aramco HQ and into the fields, and you actually set up a shoot that we did at the uh, carbon capture utilization and storage facility in the Eastern Province, and we did an interview about that. Uh, how do you move beyond this conversation, if you can start here, even for an ENI, where people say, oh, they're just doing this to put the icing on the cake so they can really protect their oil and gas uh, production? And what is the reality of that CCUS field we had 
visited just, what, three years ago, and where do you see the most potential at the same time, Akhtar? Because you're highly respected, the work you're doing within Aramco, I know for sure. Great, thanks, John. Um, I think the way we move the conversation is by action. Um, so, you know, less words, more action. Uh, steel in the ground. And I think that's where, I mean, Aramco excels. And we, we are really big believers in doing before we talk. Um, so in the last few years, we've focused on really the solution that we believe is the right path. It's something that's scalable and uh, is practical. Uh, so we have focused on technologies because technology is the only, what we believe is really the, 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 the key solution for the world to address the challenge, the, the sustainability challenge and the, and the climate challenge. Um, and I think the, uh, His Excellency's comments, you know, his st uh, speech earlier, really emphasized the need for fact-based uh, decision making. And I, that's where we start from. We start from the facts. Uh, and the fact is that uh, it's not easy to completely decarbonize the world's economy because of technical challenges that we don't have solutions yet for. Uh, so uh, if you look at, we have a great, and I, I think that the point he made of first, we need to accelerate what we do have, the solutions we do have. Renewables, that is our best solution today economically for electricity generation. We need to accelerate that. We need to triple it. I think that was a great call to action. Um, and that's something we believe in as well as Aramco. We're investing in tremendously into renewables. We're taking part in the kingdom's uh, transformation of its power sector, where 50% of the power uh, for the kingdom will be renewables by 2030. So, you know, we are very big believers oh, in but taking... Just, uh, you ran over that quickly because no, that it is was a, a relatively new target. That it was 50% by 2030. 50% by 2030. This is right. the commitment of the, uh, the, the Saudi Green Initiative to achieve 50% uh, of our uh, uh, renewable capacity. capacity. So this is a, a big change for the kingdom, but also for Aramco. We are moving to actually deliver on, uh, on the commitments. Uh, one of the biggest commitments, of course, is uh, carbon capture. We believe that's a technology that uh, has huge potential, and it's already taking off in North America through the IRA, as we already heard, but also in Saudi Arabia. We have announced the world's largest uh, carbon capture project, uh, 9 million tons that will be captured from our major industrial city, Jebel, uh, and sequestered in saline aquifers. And we're continuing to invest in the technology to bring that cost down. So I, I do want to em emphasize those challenges. Um, you know, we always look at the available solutions, but uh, we don't look at the, what's not there yet. So in terms of uh, electricity, electricity represents about 20% of the, of the primary energy mix. It doesn't, the other 80% is heat um, and uh, chemical energy and sources of energy that cannot easily be displaced with electricity. Uh, so there's a lot of technological solutions needed to displace that other 80% of energy. Uh, so I, one of the big challenges, of course, is even scaling electricity as we are. We have ways of producing electrons, but we have no cheap or competitive ways of storing those electrons. So energy storage has to be a priority for the world, and it has to be at grid scale, the kind of scales that today is provided by carbon-based energy. So that is a big focus for us as well. And we announced uh, last year as well a $1.5 billion sustainability fund to invest in venture technology, specifically around these, I would say, choke points or hurdles that the world needs to uh, overcome to really speed to decarbonization. If you want to really have decarbonization, you need to be addressing grid scale energy storage today, electrons. Uh, we can get up to 30, 40% of the grid. We can't go beyond that. Uh, without very, very costly means of storage. So that's another key technology. So I would say the key technologies for me, uh, and I mentioned that, is basically uh, grid-based, grid-scale uh, electricity storage competitive to carbon capture, to decarbonize our existing, very hard to decarbonize sectors. And for those areas where carbon capture is not possible, hydrogen. Hydrogen is your only real option uh, where you don't have the ability to capture the carbon and store it you need to use a uh, proxy for hydrocarbons to provide the energy for that 80% uh, of heat or, or chemical energy that's needed. So those are the three key, I would say, hurdles to a full decarbonization of the energy system or the economy. And I think uh, you know, that's, of course, leaving out 
agriculture, the 25% of emissions were associated with agriculture, uh, and that has its own solutions. But I would say for the industrial and uh, business world and economics, we need to focus on those three challenges. Very good, and getting the scale uh, fast enough. I think that's what came out for me in Dr. Sultan's speech, is we need all of the above. You go with the, the easier or the low-hanging fruit first with scale. Uh, Dr. Pratima, one of the frustrations that came out in that last panel I heard from Bank of America is, how do you work as OGCI to influence the ESG uh, regulation to unleash the capital? Because you have a belief of what are strong technologies, right? But how do we do the matchmaking to make sure the ESG standards match what we need in the energy sector so we don't slow down the process of innovation? And if I can ask you, too, what are you most excited about from your vantage point, because you sit as an umbrella organization here? Yeah. I think it's a, when we watch governments or regulatory agencies come up with metrics, often the metrics are not perfect for operating entities, operating companies, mm. because they just don't have the experience. So when we started investing with OGCI Climate Investments, one of the first things we did is we developed a methodology to estimate carbon reduction from our investments. So we didn't, there were no good ESG metrics today are still, I'd say, squishy. Yeah. So, and we needed to be rigorous. Our LPs are our big operating companies. They want the rigor. So we developed a methodology and we use it to make our investments, to guide our investments and we actually measure every year what our portfolio has delivered to us, right? And over, over the last four years, our portfolio has delivered over 50 million tons of CO2 equivalent at capital efficiency that is between 10 and 20x what you would get uh, what onshore wind in the US has delivered. Hmm. And that's because we know what we're targeting because we understand where the carbon is and we go for the capital efficient solutions. We also took this, we're collaborative, we took this uh, methodology public and we invited funds to join us. We have over 300 other institutions with over 60 billion of uh, AUM who've joined us in this methodology. So we think of this as a best practice. We'd like to get it closer to standard and now we're working with with large bodies. That's excellent. Okay, I want to pick up on some of the technologies to focus on, because uh, I'll have you come in right after Peng, because uh, Peng is here in the UAE and works across a number of different sectors. I'd say you're kind of the UAE disruptor, right? Uh, and the last time we had a chance to speak at Adapac, uh, and you were kind of discussing with uh, the CEO of IBM, who's going to join us mm -hmm. remotely, about what we could do in the energy sector to disrupt. How fast has that moved along since we had that conversation two years ago, Peng? Well, we've done great things with our friends at IBM since then. And uh, in addition to IBM, we've been working with, uh, <clears throat> they're here right now, I think, Amazon, <clears throat> Google, Microsoft, and others to advance a national platform for better energy management. But one thing I want to mention here, John, is that you and I spoke so much about the benefits of technology, how it can improve, even disrupt the energy sector. But I want to highlight a problem as a technologist. My, my colleagues here, they are the energy experts. I am not. I'm an AI uh, practitioner. I think there is also a, a problem we're not talking about here today. That is, technology itself can be a challenge in the day and age of AI. Let me tell you what I mean by this. The biggest disruption that happened in the past year is in the generative AI domain, known as GPT, mm. especially ChatGPT as an application. Um, we all know the power of it. It's incredible in terms of transforming how we can communicate, how we can become experts overnight without even having to read a single book. But to get to that point, to train GPT, it's extremely power hungry. Mm. We talk about the benefit of generative AI, but what's the cost of that technology? To train from GPT-1, 2, 3, now version 4, it took multiple gigawatts of power. Now companies, countries, 
are going for bigger and bigger and bigger models. We assume, well, bigger models get bit better benefit and well, just better things. But there is a huge cost and a huge energy inefficiency today in the technology itself. I think for myself and my fellow AI practitioners, when you take a hard look at this problem, as Dr. Sotong mentioned earlier, suddenly we're not just an enabler to solve energy problems, we become a big energy consumer. We have big responsibilities. For example, my company today, we're running over 300 megawatts of power data center here in the UAE. We're building huge models, even for Admark, uh, to solve energy problems. But along the way, <laughs> we are also a polluter. So I think it's critical now we look technology from the other perspective. How do we build more energy efficient technology and innovation? Okay, very good. I'm gonna circle back on a couple of ideas even to get you to talk about Adnoc and Total, for example, in collaboration uh, and some of the progress that's been made. I, I wanna uh, kind of throw our script away for a second. I'd love to have an honest conversation with you what Dr. Sultan said and that is reducing emissions, global emissions, by 43% um, by 2030. That is, you know, I, my opening comments, I talked about a global moonshot. That's not easy. He said, remove methane completely from the oil and gas industry by that time frame as well. Uh, Ahmed, I see you you're nodding, but I'm gonna leave this as an open question. Peng, you can address it from the technology side. How does it have an impact? But I think each one of us should be addressing what he asked, and that is a global moonshot. Why don't you start us, uh, Ahmed? And is that a reality in Saudi Arabia, to be able to do that? And is that what you have in mind? I think that what uh, Dr. Sultan brought up is really ambition, but uh, ambitious, but doable. Um, so on methane, for example, you know, the kingdom has invested tremendously in Aramco specifically, you know, over the last 40 years in zero return flaring. We didn't call it that, but that's what it was. In the 1970s, we established the master gas system, first major collection of natural gas that was being burned, basically associated gas, uh, which basically saved over the years many billions of tons of CO2 being emitted to the atmosphere and converted that into chemicals and uses, methanol, ammonia, uh, many, many useful uh, products for the world over the last 40 years. And that was through a process of basic technology, you know, being able to economically, at the time it was not considered economic in the 70s, to collect associated gas from wells all over the, the, the country. Um, and using that in industry. So that's a, a technology we think is very, very viable and will apply to the entire energy industry easily. Collecting methane that's being flared, that's, an, that's a no-brainer. Collecting leakage, reducing leakage, we have been able to achieve 0 0.06, which is far below uh, the world average, 0.06% mm. uh, uh, leakage, you know, which is uh, extremely low. And we think uh, the world, can, that's near zero, and we think we can even go lower with technology. Again, it's detection, uh, you know, all forms of detection, whether uh, terrestrial, satellite, um, you know, human, uh, all of that is part of the process, and then, and then uh, remediation. You know, it's a, it's a continuous process, but that's the only way, you know, that we have to take action on methane because it is a low-hanging fruit. You know, not only does it have value, but it has tremendous impact on greenhouse gases, 70 times what CO2 does. So it really is a uh, low-hanging fruit because it doesn't cost too much, it pays back, and it can have a great impact on reduction of emissions. So that's a definitely, a, I think, a no-brainer for the oil and gas industry. And we have, as OGCI, committed as a group to achieve that near zero by 2030. Um, that was announced last year. Say that again, what, what's the terminology? Oil and Gas Climate, climate Initiative committed to, uh, to near zero methane emissions, uh, methane leakage uh, by 2030. Wow. Um, and that's something we're well on our way to achieving as a group. Uh, as I said, our AMCO is almost there. We're at 0 0.06, which is uh, almost not measurable. And so that's where uh, I think there's definitely an opportunity for the entire energy industry to commit, and not just the energy industry, but all those who use methane. There's huge networks of methane based, uh, supplying all of industry. That's the, 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 the main source of energy in main parts of the world. Great, I'll stop you there because of time. Francesca, I saw you nodding, so did Pratima, and I'll have you two go next. On that same subject, uh, think about how nuclear plays into that equation I was talking about, and Peng's gonna to weigh in on the technology impact it could have on measurement even, right? That's part of the, the game here. Uh, Pratima, do you wanna start us? Sure, 
I think maybe I'll take a slightly different tag and go back to what Dr. Sultan said. He said, he said we need growth, especially in the global south, but uh, we need to do it sustainably. If we look at global GDP last year, it grew 3%. What it means is that overall, the economy is going to double. World economy is going to double in 23 years. We do, well, yet we do this with less than 50% efficiency across our industrial systems and agricultural systems, and we do it with less than 7% circularity. This means that we will double our raw material use, and with the increased use of digital technologies, that is an exponent from an energy perspective. Mm. So the view that I take is, yes, hydrogen, carbon capture, everything we've talked about, nuclear is important, but if we replicate the inefficient systems we have today, then we'll be taking two steps forward and one step back because we actually don't just need to bring these other systems to meet what we have. We have to double mm. in 23 years, right? So from us, the, our investment thesis is entirely about a cyclical and savings of energy. You'll have to be able to reduce emissions while you save resources. So we really need to go to a future where we're not just talking about capital efficiency and labor efficiency. We need to really be talking about resource efficiency because we don't have enough minerals to do it the inefficient way we do it today. And that's where we invest our dollars. Right, very interesting. Uh, do you want to jump in, Francesca, here? And I'd like to hear it from the ENI standpoint. What does it mean in ENI in practice? about removal of 43% of global emissions. What are you doing on the ground? What are you doing about methane, for example? Well, we, of course, we are doing uh, all, the te we are applying, of course, all the technologies which, which are ready to market today, of course. But at the same time, we are doing a lot about new application of new technologies, monitoring of fugitive with the satellites, with the artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and on the other side, what we are doing, we are also applying in an extensively way all uh, digital and uh, artificial intelligence to our, our existing operation, to make a more efficient operation and to reduce uh, emissions, to, to predict possible, possible problems on the plant and avoid, avoid whatever, whatever flaring, avoid whatever not, not predictable emissions. So this is really what we are doing now, today, in the, let's say, in the transition, in the transition pathway. The, then, of course, we are targeting CCUS, and we are very strong on CCUS. We are present in important projects in the UK, and we are very active and, uh, let's say, pragmatic on that, pointing to the, to the real realization of the project. Then we are very active also in uh, whatever is blue hydrogen, um, all, all the, the world of recy recycling, of plastic recycling. So we are really uh, developing technologies. We are really watching in a pragmatical way to their uh, application and to their scale up. Of course, uh, making a huge use of digital, digitalization, and uh, on this subject, I want just to remind that ENI on digitalization and artificial intelligence is present since a long time, and we are really facing this, uh, this subject in, in a way, very balanced way. We have uh, the 13th um, supercomputer in the world, the first industrial one, and it is uh, called the Green Data Center because we really have re reached a very low PUE, which is the unit efficiency of our, of our supercalculator, which is one of the lowest in the world. Is, it is air-cooled, and it is partially fed by renewable energies. So really, we are on the path in the concrete way. That's good, which most people don't know. Uh, so, uh, Peng, how do you fit into this equation there about what you think are the best applications technology-wise uh, to assist in eliminating methane from the oil and gas sector by 2030, and uh, that moonshot of uh, reducing emissions 43% by 2030 at the same time. So 
So I think uh, my energy expert colleagues here are much better at answering application questions. Maybe I can speak a little bit about the computing infrastructure, I think, required to enable such applications. Oh, interesting. Okay, good. Uh, I, I love what you said earlier about a green data center and the supercomputer used uh, by your organization. So I believe there are two fundamental enabling uh, technology driving forces that will be required to solve this very complex problem. Uh, one is a centralized technology, supercomputing. Uh, we live in this age of, I mentioned earlier, generative AI, uh, the training of larger models and multitude of models in different knowledge domains is now a must. So there will be a lot more training data sets, knowledge bases coming online, and there will be a lot of fine tuning of these models, rapid iterations that require more and more computing power. So I believe supercomputing domain will see a revolution uh, one of my top partners in the U.S. recently worked with Total, and uh, they took the multi-energy simulation model. They were working on the classical uh, GPU clusters uh, onto a new computing architecture. The result was 200 times faster simulation speed and half the energy usage. So I think you will see a lot of progress in innovative, innovative supercomputing uh, technology coming online. The second driving force will be decentralized. That's IoT devices. You mentioned earlier how do you measure, how do you collect data in the first place. I believe we'll see this massive deployment of smaller and smaller, very, very energy efficient uh, semi-organic sensors that can directly speak with satellite uh, through communication channels be deployed across the world mm. and, and uh, be embedded everywhere. I think between this sensor deployment on a global scale across the planet and also super computing power efficiency improvement, we can build this amazing computing infrastructure for the set of global problems we're facing. Great, Ooh, fantastic conversation. I thought, really thank you for taking a deep dive into it. I, I was, I'm sorry, because I kept on gleaming things from Dr. Sultan's speech, which was triggering different ideas. One of them is that there's 5,000 companies that are in steel, cement, and aluminum, right? Representing, it's extraordinary, a third of global emissions. And data centers now, too. One more time? Data centers as well. Data centers, as uh, <laughs> Francesco was bringing up, which is a, a, a fantastic point. Um, the role of nuclear in that, uh, Mohammed, I think is worth addressing here. And uh, we've had numerous conversations about how everybody thought the UAE was kind of bananas in 2008 when it started on this kind of journey, when the, the seeds were planted in terms of an idea and then the gestation period thereafter. Um, now you're, it's being duplicated around the world. There's a long list. Is this where it has the greatest impact when it comes to energy emissions reduction by targeting these 5,000 companies around the world? If I'm, I, yes, that's, that definitely will be part of, of the solution for nuclear, providing electrons, which is uh, the current main use of, of, of nuclear. But if I may take just one step back, uh, John, and maybe comment in, my, in the comments that Ding mentioned, and also uh, Ahmed. If you look at the, the uh, electron used today, you send an email through your mobile, or you just send a character in your, in your phone, it triggers a few electrons to move around, that gets sent to a server, to a cloud, it receives, somebody receives it in the other end of that, another phone or, or a laptop, whatever. Electrons keep moving all over the world and that consumes a lot of electricity. And to put that in perspective, by the way, today the data centers globally consume around 5% of the world demand, 5%. Oh, wow. On emissions, that's equivalent to all the airplanes that fly and burn uh, fossil fuel. So put that, about that in perspective, and I think my colleague mentioned that technology is becoming efficient, it's advancing, we can reduce the energy demand per device, and we've seen big gadgets and becoming small gadgets in your pocket. But now with AI coming, that needs super chips that will consume a lot of electricity, generate a lot of heat, that will increase the demand for for computing power, and this is a small 
part of the puzzle that we need to work on. So nuclear is great, can provide clean electricity. UAE, we installed the last 10 years uh, for, for reactors. We are enjoying three reactors operational. The lights you see in this room, is, some of it is powered by the nuclear power plant from Baraka. So we've done that in 10 years, we are very happy. But the future is also bigger for us because now we have the capabilities and institutional knowledge, people, capacity to be able to build more in the UAE and outside the UAE. Now the challenge I think Ahmed put in the, in the panel here is the steam, industrial steam. And to put things also in perspective for the, for the, for the audience here, industrial steam generates, and that's when I say industrial steam is the temperature, high temperature combustion that is used for uh, process of chemicals and oil and gas industries. That uh, produces roughly around the 10% of, of the world emissions comes from industrial heat. And I know it's very challenging to, decarb to decarbonize that. We've, yes. You, you talk about steel, cement, these are heavy to decarbonize sectors. Industrial steam is also difficult to decarbonize. Now, what's in it? Why I'm talking about that? In nuclear industry, the advanced reactors, the higher temperature reactors, mm. kind of produce clean steam with high temperature, 500 Celsius and above, that could produce more efficient hydrogen, could help also the oil and gas to decarbonize their sectors. So they, we have a great future ahead of us. Huge energy demand is coming in the pipeline. And if we don't decarbonize the current sectors with the current tools we have right now, with the current technology we have right now, and bet on the future or with the future technologies, we will not be able to achieve net zero. So today, UAE is on the right path. We've installed nuclear technology, we installed renewable technologies, and we put a target of net zero by 2050. And the current transformation we've seen in the last 10 years will double, quadrupled in the decades to come, and we are on the right path. Okay, uh, we only have two minutes left, so I'm gonna just ask on a couple of you to, to weigh in. Part of the criticism of, uh, is it realistic to keep net zero by 2050 alive and 1.5, is it realistic? And is the oil and gas industry really just resisting and playing a greenwashing game? Uh, Ahmed, you've heard this about Aramco. I'd love to have Dr. Pratam. I want we just leave it there because of the time we have. Uh, how do we get over this and stop the finger pointing that Dr. Sultan talked about? I think the call to action from Dr. Sultan is, is the way we get over it. I, as again, I repeat, you know, I think we have to do things and we have to demonstrate that we've actually achieved reductions. Um, and I think, you know, we walk the talk. Uh, I think we have been walking the talk. Today, Aramco is the only company shipping thousands of tons with our partners, Sabic, thousands of tons of low carbon hydrogen around the world. Now, markets aren't taking them up. Now, we cannot control the pace. The pace requires will, the will of governments and societies to uptake. Their costs are high. We've heard it. Trillions of dollars per year for the next 30 years need to be spent in order to make this transition happen. So we are availing, we're putting our effort in research and in investment in large capital projects to avail low carbon energy products for the world. We shipped in December uh, 30,000 ton low carbon ammonia. It's an investment on our part. We didn't ask for a long-term offtake agreement, but if we're gonna be spending billions of dollars, we need to have that, that uh, uh, reliability or uh, consistency from policy. And so I think that's the challenge. It's not the willingness of oil and gas. It's the willingness of the world to really commit to the, the, the necessary uh, 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 investments. And so I'm, uh, I, we're full steam ahead in finding those solutions and finding products that will meet the 1.5. Great. Uh, Pratima, we are out of time. Can you do that in 30 seconds? Because I know you're really active in this space about trying to change the narrative. Yeah, it's just action. There is, it's time for talk is over. Yeah. So I wanna leave you with maybe just an example that should cover most of what Dr. Sultan asked for, right? Simple example, we just invested in a company called Aeroseal. It basically, anywhere you have duct work, so HVAC, heating or cooling, it pumps air through, a polymer falls out everywhere that it sees a crack. It self seals the entire duct work. Right, so Hilton Riyadh, you can use it here. It's already been done, saves them about $55,000 a year. 
in the U.S. in San Francisco. There's a building. It saved a million dollars a year in energy bills. It is available all over India, fully scaled, so it is uh, cheap enough to go to the global south. But even better, imagine it now in the oil and gas infrastructure, pump it through the pipes, and it self-seals the cracks. We have to look across industries, across sectors, bring technology capability. It is run by AI, so it's perfectly, it delivers the data for you to account for what you've done. So I think we've got to be optimistic, but we have to act. Okay, very good. Uh, what a conversation. I completely agree with what you're saying here, because the agriculture sector is never talked about as a solution that needs to be an industry. It needs to be abated, uh, obviously. The building sector that you brought up, again, it's not part of the conversation, but absolutely vital in terms of total emissions. We have the industry, the 5,000 companies we talked about, but agriculture and the building space in major cities around the world uh, cannot be uh, overlooked. It's not easy, but we need to start focusing in that space. Mohammed, great to see you again. Ahmed, always a pleasure. Dr. Pratima, thanks. Peng, I, I appreciate you also, as others in the room, participating in my uh, NYU class that's coming up. That you're a gem for the students. I appreciate that. And Francesca, it's nice to meet you. Get a nice round of applause for the panel and their uh, contributions. Mm -hmm.